Hi, I'm John Morgan with the Pennsylvania Progressive. I'm in Philadelphia at the Pennsylvania AFL-CIO Convention with Reverend David Bullock from Detroit, Michigan, a pastor, Baptist preacher, uh, head of the Detroit chapter of Rainbow Push Coalition, and a few other things. What brings you to Philadelphia today? Well, John, one, let me say thanks for interviewing me and having me uh, on the program. I'm in Pennsylvania today uh, to speak to the state AFL-CIO convention. And uh, basically, I'm here because I ran into the president a couple weeks ago when I was in Harrisburg. And apparently, he felt uh, inclined to invite me to participate today. And so I'm just so honored to be here. Tell us what took you to Harrisburg. Well, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, state capital, um, was been, has been in a turmoil recently uh, around state occupation, receivership, uh, because the city uh, was having some financial difficulties. The mayor w was one way, city council the other way. Ultimately, I do believe uh, the state sent in a receiver, and that receiver uh, makes the elected officials' power uh, greatly diminished, uh, and the citizens have no voice, they have no vote, right. they have no role, which sounds a lot like in Michigan we have emergency managers in Benton Harbor, in Flint, in Pontiac, in Hamtramck. Uh, this is a law that your new Republican governor pushed that's through. That's right, Governor uh, Rick Snyder. Uh, allowing the governor to actually dismiss the elected officials in communities that's right. and take over those governments himself. That's right. Governments and school districts, in the name of a financial crisis or averting one, send in a one-person czar or a management team. The elected officials have no vote. The citizens have no voice. And so Michigan and Pennsylvania seem to share some commonality in, in how financial crisis was being used to undermine democracy. And so I, I came to Harrisburg to talk about what we were doing in Michigan and to connect Harrisburg to Benton Harbor, to Flint, yeah. to Pontiac, and then to a national struggle against voter ID laws. So you have on the one hand legislation that makes the vote null and void, and on the other hand you have legislation that sets up artificial barriers to vote. And, and for a little background for the people watching this, uh, Harrisburg had filed for uh, Act 47, which is a a financial distress uh, rescue plan for cities in distress uh, in Pennsylvania. And what happened then was uh, a Republican state legislature, state senator, uh, introduced and passed a bill allowing the state to take over the city of Harrisburg. And that passed in lightning speed. And the, uh, the state actually took over uh, control of the city of Harrisburg. That's right, that's right, that's right. Which sounds a lot like Michigan. And so I believe this is just a national agenda to privatize uh, uh, what has traditionally been public, right? To, to take public assets, right? To dismantle democracy. Right? If I get democracy out of the way, I get accountability and transparency out of the way. Right, so deals. How convenient. Contracts. That's right. We have closed door private meetings, cut deals, right? And the citizens are left in the lurch. Uh, and this is a national agenda. It's part of the voter ID agenda. It's a part of the agenda that just puts profits over big people. We bailed out the banks, we bailed out the insurance companies, but those bailouts weren't tied to local, urban, and rural reinvestment, weren't tied to loans and lending, uh, capital investment for small businesses. And so they weren't tied agenda. to even rescuing these homeowners who were being foreclosed on That's fraudulently. Right. That's right. So the very banks, right? that have predatory products, yes. that foreclose on citizens, right? And so we have forced evictions by way of fraud, right? We bail them out, right? And then they don't even have to help us out, right? right? And so this is just a part, I think, of a national shift in America that is pro-corporate, pro-1%, pro uh, anti-citizen, anti-democracy, anti 99 percent you mentioned privatization. Basically what privatization does is take government services who are accountable to the public and uh, spin them off to private businesses, corporations, whose accountability is to their owners and shareholders and not the public. And what we found in Pennsylvania was that some corrupt judges in Luzerne County we're selling kids down the river to juvenile detention facilities, which had been privatized in return for kickbacks. Indeed, because 
once you privatize any service, right, uh, the citizens have no voice. There's no accountability to the public. More importantly, the agenda of the, of the privatized entity is to maximize profit uh, at any cost. And so in the case of prisons, right, we need to fill these beds, right? In, in the case of schools, we need to fill these classrooms. Right, so it's not about education, it's not about rehabilitation. It's about profit. It's about profit maximization. Yeah. What's happened in some states that have privatized their regular corrections facilities, their state prisons, is that the contracts require like an 80% occupancy rate, and some places have actually passed new laws making minor offenses right. uh, punishable by prison in order to fill to the prisons fill the prison. to Right. Fulfill the contracts. Fill the contract to maximize the money. And then the prisoners are exploited because now we're firing union workers, right, or workers in southern states. And the prisoners right? are doing and the, the work. prisoners are doing the work for pennies on the dollar. And who is profiting from all of this? Well, I'll tell you what, not the public, not the people, not the communities, right? Families lose fathers and mothers, sons and daughters, right? Communities lose assets, right? And so uh, whoever's profiting is not the American people. Well, it's the corporations who, who, own the, who own the prisons and who are contracting the work Indeed. and profiting from basically slave labor in the prisons. Now, you mentioned voter ID. Pennsylvania has now passed a voter ID law. Uh, 700,000 Pennsylvanians do not have a state-issued photo ID. Uh, most of the demographics affected by this, interestingly enough, ironically enough, happen to be Democrats. <laughs> That's right. That's this, right. this is one of your major issues. You, you touched on it in your speech upstairs. Uh, talk to us about that. Well, look, voter fraud has all of a sudden become the mantra of the Republican Party, as if there have been these massive amounts of cases to vote fraud. And then under the guise of that, states around the nation implement voter ID laws right, to fight voter fraud. Right? Now, most of the people affected by these voter ID laws are seniors, vote Democrat, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, other minorities who typically vote. Democratic. And so disabled have, people. Right, disabled people. Right. So you have a you have a disenfranchisement of democratic voters, right? Seniors, of minority voters. And and it's almost as if they're doing point shaving. Right? If I want to steal an election, I don't have to steal it all right, outright, right? If I just shave the points, right? If I create a barrier for people so that they may not be inclined to vote, they may not have ID, they may not be able to afford ID, ID may not may not even be a part of their culture in certain kinds of ways, right? And I and I limit the amount of people who are inclined to vote, then I can steal the election. So I think this is a national agenda ultimately to affect the outcome of the presidential election. Because we heard it said when President Barack Obama got elected that the number one agenda of the Republican Party was not to make America great, but it was to make Barack Obama you mentioned in your speech uh, that uh, they want to sink the ship in order to sink the captain. That's right. That's right. They want to blow up the ship to sink the captain. Uh, and, and in the process, if we're on the ship, we're going down too. And so we should not fall for the rhetoric, right? This is not about Republicans. This is about the Republic. This is not even really about Democrats. This is about democracy. And we, we must come together and fight for our future, right? And fight the war against poverty, not war on the poor, right? Fight for the children, right? For those who are, who are losing or lost unemployment. Fight for those who are in distressed communities and depressed who have no hope, right? And reignite what it means to be an American and reinvigorate the American dream. But there are people in this country who are blaming the poor people for all the country's ills. Indeed, there are insensitive, silly people who actually think that poor people are the reason why America is facing that the problems that it's facing. No, what we've seen is we've seen the failure of the Great Society program. Right, all of the air came out of that topic. The the response to the riots in urban cities around the United States of America, 1968, 67, 68, 69, and the public policy response for full employment for public housing accommodations, uh, for change in education, for urban revitalization, right? We, we've seen now 
uh, after the civil rights movement, uh, the great successes of that movement, after the women's rights movement, the great successes of those movements, after the anti-Vietnam, anti-war uh, protests. We see now uh, a, a, a different public policy, a conservative approach rule the day. And so we're seeing public policy decisions being made by people who want small government, who want a states' rights agenda, who want a pro-corporate and privatization agenda, uh, and that's just the wrong agenda. You said upstairs, we need to change the culture. Expand on that a bit and, and kind of review what your remarks were in that regard. Well, well I think um, right now we're in a tug of war, both in terms of what America will look like, what the appropriate political language is, and what the appropriate pol political priorities are. Right now, right, we're pro-American empire, right? Coming out of so many wars, spending so much money overseas, reinvesting in Iraq, reinvesting in Afghanistan, but not Detroit, but not Philadelphia, right? Uh, not reinvesting in, in Harrisburg. So, so we have an agenda that is pro-American empire. We have an agenda that is pro-corporation, at the expense of citizens, right? War on the poor, not war on poverty, right? Not a war against hunger, not put America back to work, not fight for the American worker. So we build bridges uh, to overseas nations with our trade policy and ship jobs overseas while they build walls and don't accept American uh, imports. And so uh, the changing the culture means refocusing the mindset of the, of the citizen to say, I want big federal government. I want trade policy uh, that's fair and not free, right? I, I, I want a country uh, that is safe on the foreign front, right, but is also safe on the domestic front. And so in Detroit, we've had 64 uh, homicides in two and a half months. The Trayvon Martin case and all of the protests around the nation signal a resentment setting in in America by, on behalf of American citizens. And so we must fight back to change the mindset of those who are making public policy decisions as well as those who are being affected by those, those decisions. You mentioned Trayvon Martin. Yeah. This case has just riveted the nation right. uh, uh, in the last week, 10 days. Do you think this is a, a response to all this extreme lunatic fringe, especially the, the racial uh, language that we've seen in the, the Republican campaigns this year? I think the Trayvon Martin case is, is about more than Trayvon Martin. Obviously, uh, we, we pray for the family, we mourn his passing. Uh, uh, he was killed in cold blood. Uh, Zimmerman should be arrested. But beyond that, there is an angst, I think, in America. People are frustrated. People, people are beginning to resent the process. The president is being branded in ways that we were thought unheard of for anyone who's in the office of the president. So I think the marchers in, in the nation and around the world, because they have been protesting mm -hmm. yeah. overseas, is a response uh, to a climate where folks are saying enough is enough. Now, can we translate that into political gains? Can we take the Occupy movement from the streets to state capitals? and not only occupy the streets, but occupy the polls and occupy the seats. That question remains to be seen, and that's part of why we're here today, because organized labor has to be a part of that organization, right? We must take the pain and the passion that is in the community, that, that citizens feel, we must tap it into infrastructure and organize it so that passion can transform public policy. Well, I'll tell you, you electrify that room upstairs with your speech. Uh, I saw people coming in to catch parts of it from, you know, wow. uh, those people manning the, the booths and stuff in the hallways and stuff to, to catch your speech. It was just a, an electrifying uh, a speech. And you really fired up the, these labor people here today. Uh, but there has to be something after a convention like this. Uh, there has to be follow through. How do you make sure people do that? Yeah, you know, I think that's a great question. And, and I think... Uh, the labor movement is organized, right? It's organized labor. And so part of the follow-through is just connecting the dots. We've got, we've got pieces here. We just can't operate in silos. We can't operate in ethnic silos, black versus white. We can't operate in ideological silos, integrationists versus nationalists versus communists versus, 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 versus. We can't operate in labor silos, SEIU, AFSCME, right? Uh, we've got to come together. And I think the real work uh, is not inventing infrastructure, it's connecting infrastructure. And I think that work is being done right now. The fact that I'm here from Michigan in Pennsylvania, uh, 
a pastor addressing a labor convention that's statewide already seems to foreshadow the networking that needs to happen to bring all of the troops together. Now, frankly, most of the people in that room upstairs were white. Uh, Philadelphia organized labor has a history of racial animosity. Uh, for decades and decades, it's been very, very difficult for African Americans to join the labor trade unions here in the city of brotherly love. A lot of this is due to divisions that have been foisted by the elites of society setting working people against each other by race, by class, by sexual orientation, by whatever means they can. Um, you know, one of the themes today is, you know, we hang together or we hang separately, as, as Patrick Murphy mentioned in his speech, the famous Ben Franklin quote. Uh, how do we overcome especially the racial divisions within organized labor. So everyone is pulling together. Well, well I think we just have to do it. We just have to set uh, an agenda that's very intentional uh, about breaking down racial barriers. We must interact. We must work together. We must find common ground. I think there needs to be a conversation about uh, what do we have in common uh, in terms of our agenda. I believe that our political life both, both in the church, in the country, in labor. Our political life in America is so personally driven, so driven by personality, uh, that, that sometimes we can't come together on policy. I think we have more in common uh, and that we need to fight for than to be focused on the stuff that divides us. And are some people prejudiced? Of course they are, uh, on both sides, right? But, but we cannot let the minority that is ignorant Right, uh, make us lose the elusive dream of our unity and diversity. Those of us who, who, who know what we need to do need to be courageous and empowered to come together and do that. Part of your speech, you're basically telling these labor organizers not to whine and, and kind of pout about all the attacks being mounted by corporate America against labor movement, but to get out and educate people. That's right. That's right, right. We cannot, we cannot spend our time complaining, right? We should be spending our time gaining. I mean, we cannot, you know, uh, swim in blessings and drown in complaints. Right? The labor movement uh, has a history. It was started for a reason. I mean, and, and, and we have been so blessed, I think. Right? We've gained so much that we, lo that we have sometimes, I think, forgotten the fighting spirit. Right? It, it was the fighting spirit that got us here. Right? And it, it is the fighting spirit that will keep us here. And we, we struggle. Struggle is a part of, of life, right? Building the wall, right? We're restoring the infrastructure, uh, educating uh, the, the generation that is before and that is coming about what happened before they got here. These are the things that we must do. So we can't worry about it or mind about it. We just, need to, we just need to do what it is that we have to do. We have to roll up our sleeves and get roll out there and work. Sleeves, get out there and work. And look, when we work hard, good things come our way, right? When we fight back, we win. Look at look at how far this country has has come. Right? Look, look at the gains that we've made, both racially, uh, economically, uh, culturally, and socially. But but these were hard fought fought, fought gains. I mean, these didn't just happen. You know, folks didn't just pass these laws because they wanted to. Right? You know, uh, we we didn't get uh, vacation pay and uh, a work week, 40 hours. We we didn't get that because folks wanted to give it to us. We didn't get anti-child labor provisions just because they didn't want children to work. We got the Civil Rights Act because of Come marches on. in Selma. Alabama. Selma, Alabama. Uh, uh, marches in Memphis, Tennessee. When Dr. King died, representing AFSCME workers, garbage workers, right? Uh, uh, it was the, the march after his death, which also signaled landmark legislation. And so when we hit the streets, we win, right? When we fight back, we win. When we work together, we win. We cannot be frustrated. We cannot put our head in the sand. We got to roll up our sleeves. Well, speaking of hitting the streets, you're talking about doing a march from Detroit to Lansing, Michigan mm -hmm. to protest this law in, in Michigan taking right. over local government. Right. It's a 93 mile walk. That's right. It's a stride toward freedom. It's a march for justice. And uh, if there can be a trail of tears, there can be a walk to victory. And if that takes 93 miles, all you got to do is put one foot in front of the other and keep your eye on the prize and we'll go that way. And, and so it's not the distance, right? It's the dream, right? It's the destiny. It's where we're headed. And we must dramatize how serious we are about what we seek.
to make this country become. The all these right-wing efforts, uh, whether it's voter ID, taking over local government, and, and you know, the stand your ground law, which we have now in Pennsylvania also, uh, all these efforts, the, the uh, bills to, to require illegal searches of women's vaginas, um, these are all building a backlash. What do you see maybe dangerously happening in the future? Should Republicans get more power this fall? Should they win? Get more power this fall. I think we will see 67, 68, all over again. People are already a little frustrated. Despair. Despair is a terrible thing. If I don't have hope, write yes. yes. it down. If I don't have hope, tear it up, destroy it. I'm not. I don't want to be a part of any process. And I think uh, the Republican power elite are creating a climate where people no longer believe in the process. And that's very, very dangerous. And so we must fight back, not just for ourselves, but for our country, right? to turn the tide of riotous, uncontrolled, radical rebellion, right? so that the embers and flames of discontent don't burn too hotly and destroy neighborhoods. And, and turn into violence. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, that, so that's something that we're also concerned about. And I've said this. I've said this to Governor Snyder in Michigan. I said, sir, be very careful uh, about the public policies you support. Uh, you might be sowing the very seeds uh, that will come back not only to haunt your political career, right, but that might haunt the very livelihood of people who live in Michigan. And that same warning should go out to the Republican power elite. I mean, America is America because democracy keeps us connected in a nexus of hope that by way of dialogue and fair participation in the process, right, everybody at least has a voice, right, everybody at least is heard, everybody counts. When I start thinking I don't count then we're headed down a slippery slope towards violent, uh, uh, rebellious, and riotous action. And we don't need that. That's something that we don't need. So we must fight against that possibility. There's a saying that the only stronger emotion than fear is hope. But once people lose hope, they turn to okay. radical alternatives. Um, this whole voter suppression effort centered around voter ID to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Everyone knows what it's really about. It's about suppressing the vote this fall. That's right. And won't that result in people losing hope if they lose their franchise? Sure. I mean, that's why we cannot allow the suffrage to be suffocated, to liberty to be lynched, because we don't want people to lose hope. Malcolm X gave us the options, the ballot or the book. So why would someone intentionally take the ballot away and then put laws on the books to empower people who had books, stand your ground laws, right? And so this, this seems to almost be an intentional creation of escalation of a culture of, 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 of violent response that is not going to serve the business community, it's not going to serve the activist community, the labor community, the faith community. Uh, and so we must be uh, the canary in the mine, right? Let, let, letting the miners know this danger is down there. We must be the candle burning in the dark. We must be the, the bell uh, that tolls and lets people know that we are in a critical season in the history of our country. Uh, we will decide this year what trajectory America will be on for the years to come. Well, thank you very much, Reverend, you. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming to Philadelphia. Thank you so much.